Lord, I thank you as well as Frank prayed, Father, for the salvation that you've provided from uh, your wrath, from your anger, your righteous indignation over sin and over rebellion against you, our creator, a gracious creator. And Father, there's no escape. There's no place to hide from such a, uh, a global and complete destruction other than in your son. And you've provided in your son, as it were, an ark like Noah and his family were able to go into to escape the floods. Father, by being in Christ, we can escape that wrath to come and, and not even experience it, as Frank mentioned in his prayer. And we thank you at this time of year uh, as we can celebrate the very beginning of that redemption that you provided and the entering of your son into the world to take on human flesh and to live for us and die for us. And we thank you for for him, and we thank you for your written word that you've uh, preserved for us and made available to us. We know it's by that word that we're born again into your son and into new life. And so we thank you for all these things. And as we have the opportunity now to hear from your word, uh, please let it be that life to us. Help us to understand it. Help us to worship you more and know you better because of this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go ahead and turn. Uh, I don't have slides. Uh, David, can you take us to the next slide or even, yeah. um, I guess I can do that right here. Okay, you got it. Thank you. Um, go ahead and turn to Isaiah 8. You, you'll want to have, I don't have slides today, so you're going to want to have um, you know, your scriptures ready to um, turn. We're going to look at a number of different places today, but we're going to spend the majority of our time uh, in Isaiah and just you know, our goal for this week, or last week, we looked at Isaiah 8 through 9 and tried to demonstrate that the prophecies there were about Judah's deliverance from Assyria. And it was through the birth of Hezekiah and a Gideon-like victory uh, that we, uh, we saw that was what was being prophesied and spoken of in Isaiah 8 in the beginning of 9. This week, our goal is going to be to explain how that same section can nevertheless be fulfilled in Jesus. And we'll reread, especially Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 with that in mind at the end together. So again, last week, you look at Isaiah 8, the end of 8, the beginning of 9. It's very clearly about Hezekiah's birth and the Gideon-like deliverance over Assyria and what the faithful remnant, what the faithful believers in God were to do as that day approached. But that same section is somehow, we'll see, fulfilled in Jesus, and we want to talk through what that means. So let's start, just turn to Isaiah 7. I'm going to do the same as well. Um, let's just start by reviewing just briefly again what we've learned in the past and, and work up a little bit of context before we prepare to, to take it further this week. So Isaiah 7, you recall, was another king, King Ahaz, who was uh, facing a coalition of armies against him, the Syrians and Israel were coming against him, and he was afraid, and rightly so, he was afraid. But God said to him, don't be afraid. You don't have to fear. They're going to be defeated. Don't fear. Trust me. You don't have to be afraid of this coalition of armies. And said, in fact, Ahaz, I'm willing to give you a sign, any sign, because I know it'd be hard to believe, given the amount of uh, defeat you've experienced in this short part of your career so far as king of Israel. I know that may be hard to believe, uh, but I will give you a sign, any sign you would like, to show you that you are not going to be defeated this time. And Ahaz had already made up in his mind to call for help, right? To call uh, for a bigger bully to take care of the two bullies who were bullying him. And he, he was already determined to call to, Sen to, not to Sennacherib, but to the king of Assyria at that time for help. And God said, well, here's a sign. I'll give you a sign, even though you don't ask for it. There's going to be a child born to a young maiden. Uh, to a virgin even. There's going to be a child that's born. And before that child can say, my father or my mother, or, or choose between good and evil, the two kings who you dread, their land will be forsaken. And sure enough, in Isaiah 8, Isaiah goes to the prophetess, likely not his wife, likely a young maiden who had not been married previously, goes to her, and that prophetess in Isaiah chapter 8 conceives and bears a son. And they make a real public demonstration of this event so that anyone who's wanting to trust in God's word, right? These same people who were told, uh, you know, don't listen, don't listen to the true prophets, don't listen to them. Uh, 
these people could hear the word to Ahaz and to his house and they could trust and they could see the sign. They could see the deliverance promised through that sign and they could trust in God. But in, in whole or in mostly whole, folks didn't do that. Just like Ahaz trusted in uh, Assyria rather than God, most of the people did as well. And as a result, in Isaiah 8, 5 through 10, uh, we read about what's going to happen, and particularly at the end of 7 as well. Assyria is now going to come, and it's going to be somebody they really do need to worry about, unlike Israel and Syria. They really do need to worry about Assyria. It's going to come. They kind of hired him to do their bidding, but he's not going to stay within the confines of what he was hired to do. He's going to come, and he's going to ultimately destroy Israel and threaten Judah. And that's where a year ago we, we finished up in Isaiah 8, 5 through 10, and we read that uh, that river, that mighty river of the Euphrates, which represents the king of Assyria, was going to overflow its banks, sweep on into Judah, verse 8 of chapter 8, will overthrow and pass, overflow and pass through and reach even to the neck, that is Jerusalem, and the spread of its wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. But then the prophet, as they often do, switches very quickly on a dime to something new and says, Be broken, O peoples, and be shattered, and give ear, all remote places of the earth. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, because God is with us. So a promise that even though Assyria was going to come as a result of Ahaz's bad choice, even though they were going to come and destroy almost well, destroy Israel and almost all of Judah, save Jerusalem. Ultimately, they were going to fail. That's where we left off a year ago. And this year, last week, we said, how's that going to happen? What does that mean for me as someone who wants to trust in God? Say more. That's amazing. What's going to happen? And that's where our section, Isaiah 8, 11 through 9, 7, we have the word because or for given five times in those 20 verses. And we have an explanation of exactly how that's going to happen. How is it going to be that we're delivered from Assyria ultimately? The first section was in 11 through 22, basically the rest of chapter 8. And the answer was, the first four is in verse 14, because God will be for you a sanctuary if you trust him and don't fear. For those that fear, he's going to be a stumbling block. He's going to be one that causes you to be shattered and taken yourselves. But if you trust him... He'll be a sanctuary. He'll be a safe place for you. And then again, Isaiah says, Bind up that law. Seal that word among my disciples, and we'll wait for God. Through all the devastation, we'll wait. We'll trust in him. And we, he looks like he's turned his face on him, but he is going to deliver us, as he said. And behold, me and my children are signs that that's going to be the case. If you begin to wonder if God's really going to deliver us because of how bad, and it was awful. Again, we read in Isaiah 1, Jerusalem was like a cucumber hut in a field. Everything was raised except for that one city. And if you have a hard time continuing to trust that God's going to deliver you, remember Mahershal Hashbaz, my son. Remember how the two nations you feared previously were taken care of and how that sign came true. And remember my other son, Sha'ir Jashub, a remnant will return. And we are signs and we are wonders that you can look to and trust. But at the end of 8, again, people are not going to do that. They're going to say, uh, we're in a lot of trouble Let's get some help from somewhere. God has turned his face on us. Let's consult the mediums and the spiritists. And he says, do not do that. Don't do that. They're going to pass through the land. They're going to be hungry. They're going to be distressed. They're going to look up and they're going to curse God. And if they would only just look down, behold, darkness is starting to be banished. Whoa, how? And he explains the second four or because in, in chapter 9, verse 1, because there's going to be no more gloom. Darkness is going to turn to light. In the same way that in the past Zebulun and Naphtali were treated with contempt but later made glorious, you're going to see a light is going to dawn, and you just need to wait. How's that going to happen? Well, verse 4 is another because or for. Because there's going to be a Gideon-like victory, right? There's going to be a breaking of the oppressor just like it was done in the days before when Gideon, through the Lord's deliverance, defeated Midian. There's going to be a similar breaking of the rod of the oppressor. How is that possible? Well, another because, verse 5, because it's going to be such an amazing turnaround that the spoil will be used for burning because there's just going to be, a, ultimately, 185,000 instances of armor and spoil available, more than they need, and so they'll just burn the excess of it. It's going to be an amazing deliverance. 
How? How is that going to be? And then finally, the last four are because, in verse nine, verse 6 of chapter 9, because a son is born. A son who's going to be a wonderful counselor, who's going to counsel the right thing, unlike Ahaz. He's going to counsel, he's going to be, we're going to see the might of God through him, right? He's going to protect us. He's going to bring peace. And ultimately, we said, hey, that it looks like Hezekiah. And the rest of the book confirms that Hezekiah was the one who was born and who, through his prayer and turning to the Lord, brought about the deliverance of Jerusalem from Assyria. So that's what we learned last week. It's a very thorough explanation for the disciples of Hezekiah, excuse me, of Isaiah's day or Hezekiah's day, a very thorough explanation of how they were going to be delivered from the Assyrian. Five times he gives further explanation of what's going to happen. And while it was a thorough explanation for them, they're called out specifically in 816, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. While that was certainly the purpose of this passage of scripture, as we mentioned, it's also quoted six times in the New Testament. Those 20 verses, six times in the New Testament, maybe seven, and referred to at least six times as well indirectly. So what's the New Testament doing? Is it just interested in the history when it refers to it? Is it saying, hey, this happened back in the past with Hezekiah? Right? Well, let's look. Let's look at just three. I'm not going to look at all 12 or 13 of those references, but let's look at three or four of them and just see what's happening. And and again, I don't have slides, so I'm going to have us all sword drills. You know, we're going to turn and and look at these ourselves. So keep one hand in Isaiah 8, right? We're going to look at verses 14 and 15 first. 14 and 15, right? He'll become a sanctuary. To both houses of, the, of Israel, though, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over, a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them. They will be broken, snared, and caught. Again, very much, very clear. It's the first explanation of what's going to happen. Very anchored in the historical situation. We talked about how there was a word play with not calling out for conspiracy and how that was like when he told Ahaz to be calm Right, Keshur and Keshet. We talked about even God speaking to him with a mighty hand. It sounded like Hezekiah. So there's a lot uh, in that those verses that are very clearly anchored in the historical situation. I mean, be, being a sanctuary, but God being a sanctuary to them was very much how are you going to be delivered from this Assyrian onslaught? Yeah, he would be a safe place for some, but for others, he would they would be taken. They would stumble over it, and they would not trust in the Lord, but they would rather trust in medium spiritist idols or other nations. Now turn with me to Romans in the New Testament, Romans chapter 9, and let's look at the Apostle Paul. Quote this section directly. I'm going to start in Romans 9.30. So Paul says, what shall we say then? Verse 9, verse 30 of chapter 9. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith. But as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone. Just as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. So interestingly, while it was very much anchored in the historical situation, while it was very much a a prophecy of some being delivered from Assyria and others being snared and taken, Paul looks back and says, You know, this is actually, the stone to stumble over is not speaking of improper ways of escape from Assyria, but improper ways of escaping from unrighteousness, right? Turning to uh, the law and works of the law rather than by faith. First Peter, David uh, took us through this. Um, I guess maybe we were in the driveway at this time. Uh, In first Peter 2, he speaks and says... uh, that the, the folks to whom he is writing have been built up as a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This is 1 Peter 2, 5. Because, here's what's in Scripture. I'm laying a choice stone, and this precious value, though, is for those who believe, but for those who disbelieve, 
Verse 8, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So again, Peter looks at it and says, hey, that speaks of the rejection of Christ, the rejection of him among those who should have looked to him for deliverance to become that spiritual house. So interesting. I mean, maybe Peter, he doesn't speak about the word being fulfilled or any such thing. Maybe he's just using the language of the Old Testament to explain what's happening. But let's let's go on. That's one example where the the New Testament takes interest in Isaiah 8 and quotes it, uh, but in a, in a different way than we might expect based on what we learned of, of Isaiah 8 when we studied it together. Let's look at Isaiah 8, 17 through 18. And if you have your hand still there, if not, it's okay, I'll read it. And then your other finger can make its way to Hebrews. This is where Isaiah 17 and 18, he says, I'm going to wait for Yahweh, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. So I know all this devastation is coming. I know deliverance is coming at the same time. So I'm going to wait for the Lord. I'm going to wait. I'm going to trust in him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from Yahweh of hosts who dwell on Mount Zion. So again, very anchored in the historical situation. We're going to trust in the Lord. It looks like he's turned his face away. And my children are going to be the signs for us to turn to so that we'll maintain our faith even as things get really hard. Hebrews 2.13, interestingly enough, is talking about Christ and the need for him to... uh, take on flesh to become like us, to be able to um, be sanctified through suffering in the same way that we are. And Hebrews 2.10 says, It was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory to perfect the author of their salvation, Christ, through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father. For which reason... He is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, and this is from Isaiah 8, 17, I will put my trust in him. And again, from Isaiah 8, 18, behold, I am the children whom God has given me. I, that I will put my trust in him may not sound like Isaiah 8, 17 to you, but that's because he's quoting from the Greek Old Testament, not the Hebrew Old Testament. It's translated a little differently in the Greek. The end of 17, it says, I will put my trust in him, as opposed to the Hebrew, which is translated in your English versions, which is, I will look eagerly or wait for him. But that's a quotation from the Greek version of Isaiah 8, 17. And clearly, behold, I and the children whom God has given me is a quotation from Isaiah 8, 18. The author to Hebrew says that both of those verses demonstrate that both Jesus and And believers, followers of Jesus, have the same Father and are all together experiencing sanctifying suffering. Jesus, he looks at Isaiah saying, Behold, I am the children whom you have given me. And says, Look, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers, those that he is bringing to salvation and who will suffer sanctification, suffer and bring about sanctification as a result in the same way that Jesus did. And you think, well, that's interesting, because that's not what Isaiah 8 was about. Was that was that Jesus speaking there? I don't understand, right? So it's just, again, let's go on. It gets worse before it gets better. Okay, Isaiah 9 was that comment about how, hey, darkness is beginning to dispel. How's that? Well, because the dawn has come. In the same way, just like in the old days, he treated Zebulun and Naphtali with contempt, but then he, made, he brought it glorious through the what Gideon did. In that same way, light is coming. And Matthew, who really challenges us more even than the author of Hebrews, more than any other New Testament author, you know, challenges us in understanding how he uses the Old Testament, says in Matthew 4, starting in verse 12, Jesus had heard that John the Baptist had been taken into custody, and then he withdrew, therefore, to Galilee, to the northern part of Israel. And leaving Nazareth, Jesus came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and to those who were sitting in the land and shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. He says, Jesus' movement 
from Nazareth to Capernaum fulfills that scripture. Now, that scripture wasn't a prophecy, right? It was an explanation of how darkness was beginning. What is it? They look down to the earth and darkness is beginning to dispel. Why? Because a light is coming. In the same way that there was a change in the days of Gideon, behold, dawn is coming. Right? And it was certainly the dawn of deliverance from Assyria. So what is Matthew, what is Matthew doing here? What is it, how is it that Jesus fulfills this? And lastly, if there was a verse that you would expect to be used in the New Testament, it would be from our passage in Isaiah 8 and 9. It would certainly be Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, right? For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, the government will rest on his shoulders, and so on. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Interestingly enough, that verse is never quoted in the New Testament, surprisingly. You might be surprised at that. One reason may be because, again, most of the New Testament apostles quoted from the Greek version of <laughs> the Greek version of the New Testament, of the Old Testament, excuse me, the LXX, the Septuagint. And it has a really, sometimes it has really interesting translations of the Hebrew. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert in this. I don't know why. Maybe they had a different manuscript. Maybe they didn't understand. Maybe they were trying to interpret it and wondered how this could be true of someone. I'm not sure. But the Greek version of Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given, whose government is upon his shoulder, and his name is called the Messenger of Great Counsel, because I will bring peace on the princes and health to him. So you can hear a little bit of the verse, you know, Prince of Peace. He says, I'll bring peace on the princes. But it, it, that's possibly why that was not quoted in the New Testament. It might be an indirect reference to it in Luke 2, when it says, For today in the city of David there's been born to you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Right? That's very possibly an indirect reference to it. But it's not directly quoted in the New Testament. It is referenced by early church fathers. Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, and Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John, so we're talking early 2nd century. He quoted it in his work against heresies. Uh, Clement of Alexandria in the 2nd century, around 150, quoted it as well. So early church fathers recognized that this was a, a reference to Jesus, uh, even though, again, it, as much as any of the others, was anchored in that historical situation. It was an explanation of how this light was going to come. How is this Gideon-like deliverance going to happen? Because a child was going to be born. So what do we say to this? Those are all the examples we'll look at right now for the sake of time. What do we say to this? Should Some say the New Testament ought to be uh, discounted because of this. It's not treating the Old Testament text accurately. And, and it's not in one sense, right? I mean, let's just say it's certainly taking what was written in a historical context and it's using it for you know a fulfillment of something much later. Um Others say, no, 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 it's not that the New Testament should be discounted. We are misunderstanding it. Those passages you read wrong, they were talking about the future. They were talking about uh, Jesus and how he would view his brethren or, or the Jesus' movement up to the, uh, the northern regions of Israel. It's only about the future. It's not about the invasion of Judah by Assyria. So what do we say to that? Well, recall... Uh, last year, we had this exact same question when we studied Isaiah 7. And to me, is even clearer than Isaiah 8 about Maher Shahal Hashbaz being the child that was predicted, the sign child for the defeat of Israel and Syria. And yet, at the same time, Matthew 1 said that Jesus' birth to Mary was fulfillment of Isaiah 7:14, right? We had the same issue, and when we studied that, I know it was a long time ago. It's out there on the internet if you want to see it. But when we when we talked about that, we we kind of tried to be funny, and we said, well, one of two things may be true: either Matthew was wrong, the apostle, right? He was wrong when he said that Jesus fulfilled that. And I said, well, I don't really like that. I I've come to believe in Jesus of Scripture, and you know, I'm trying to figure out how he's right, not trying to prove him wrong. I know he's right. I know he's the Son of God. So I don't like that one. So the other option is Matthew, that is me, was wrong, right? And, and really, he was predicting the future Messiah. But we said, no, we're going to take a third route. We're going to try to have our cake and eat it too. We're going to say Isaiah 7.14 was about historical, uh, the, the sign, the birth of Mahershal Hashbaz, but Jesus also does fulfill it. 
And to try to you know, keep ourselves honest, we quoted from a Jewish rabbi named Tovia Singer who said, you can't do that, Christians. You've got to pick one of those others. You've got to either ignore and be awful interpreters. I don't mean that. That's, I, have, I have people I greatly respect who think it's future only. Don't give, I should not say it that way. People I truly respect. But you've got to either be, I'm going to say, you've got to have a bad interpretation of that because it is clearly about a historical event. Or you've got to give up this Jesus in this New Testament. And we say, no, no, that's not true. We're going to be good interpreters. We're going to understand it has historical fulfillment, but we're also going to trust the apostles when they say that Jesus fulfilled this. And we looked at Tovia Singer, Rabbi Singer. He's a very, very you know, learned man, really enjoyable to, to listen to. Um, not a believer. Uh, he's a Jewish rabbi. He said, I'll say two things to that. He said, first, there is, and he calls it dual fulfillment. It's not my words. I don't really like it, but you understand why he would call it that. He said, first, there is no, no basis for dual fulfillment in Scripture. There's not a basis for that concept in general. And second, even if there was, there's nothing in Isaiah 7 that makes you think that there would be a dual fulfillment. That was his quote that we took last year. And to the first of those, we argued, no, there is. In fact, we don't even have to go out of the Old Testament to prove that. We don't even have to go into what he would view as a corrupt New Testament to show that that concept happens. In fact, let's stay in the Old Testament. You may have wondered why on this great morning of Christmas cheer we read Zephaniah 1 of all scriptures and the utter destruction of the world in Zephaniah 1. Well, it was very clear. Zephaniah wrote just before Babylon destroyed Judah, right before it, on the, on, the, on the eve of that destruction. And it's very clear that just like Isaiah and just like Ezekiel and just like Jeremiah, that they viewed the day of the Lord as the, the event that would bring about the destruction of Judah and ultimately the destruction of Babylon by Medo-Persia. That was the day of the Lord to them. I mean, Zephaniah himself, I don't know how he could make it more clear, right? The day of the Lord is near, coming very quickly, right? It's here, right? And yet, unlike Isaiah, unlike Jeremiah, unlike Ezekiel, the 12, which is what we call, I'll say it because I have to, the minor prophets, right? They have no record of the destruction of Judah. In fact, it ends with Malachi saying, Behold, I'm going to send Elijah my servant before the great and coming terrible day of the Lord, which is still future. And again, so I'm a Jewish rap, I'm not. I'm a Jewish <laughs> rabbi, right? And I'm saying, wait a second. I thought that the day of the Lord was in 586 in, in the environs of that time. What is Malachi in 400 and whatever pointing forward saying the day of the Lord's future? So you see there is, though, there are indications that prophets may speak in about an event and there might be a greater fulfillment yet to come without even having to leave the Old Testament. And in fact, in Zephaniah, right, are there any indications that he might be talking about something that goes beyond the contemporary event? What did his language sound like to you? I, I, let's see if I can get to Zephaniah quickly. It's an amazing book. Listen to, listen to some of these verses and tell me what event it sounds like to you. I will completely remove all things from the face of the earth, declares Yahweh. I will remove man and beast, remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea. I will cut off man from the face of the earth. And he ends the chapter, neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of Yahweh's wrath. All the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. He will make a complete end, a terrifying end of all the inhabitants of the earth. What does that sound like to you? What event? Say it again. Second Peter. Okay, yes, but you're going, you're going, you're the flood. the flood, right? That's right. And I believe the day of the Lord event is Second Peter three, where He's going to destroy all the world with fire. But it sounds like the flood, right? Now I am here to tell you that the destruction of Judah by Babylon was awful. It was terrible. I mean, it was a horrible event. They completely burned the temple. I mean, fires that burned up large blocks and and metal and I mean. Awful destruction really mistreated the people, a, a horrible event. But it wasn't this horrible, right? This was, there are no people left on the face of the earth. 
right? So this is, there are indications even within Zephaniah, if you read it and you say, okay, let's say I believe in dual fulfillment. Let's say I'm okay with that concept, all right? Well, this might be a place where I should apply it because look at how he speaks. Is it possible he said more than he intended to say? And again, Zephaniah, he, what do you think Zephaniah is thinking? He's thinking about the destruction of Judah by Babylon, but he's taking this vision. I don't know how Zephaniah heard from the Lord. A lot of times it was through a vision or a dream. He's taking that. He's trying to describe it. And what he writes is more than that historic event. So that's how we answered um, the, the counter argument that you can't have your cake and eat it too. And we said in Isaiah 7, there were indications there too. And we won't repeat those. Again, that's online. But we're at the same place this year. Right? We're at the same place where uh, Tobia Singer, again, I love listening to him, but he'll say that Matthew 4 and the quotation of Isaiah 9, 1 and 2 is the most corrupt example of the New Testament in all the New Testament's writings. And I'll say, no, I, I don't think so. I understand. I agree with you. In fact, he doesn't. He takes the King James Version one. Do you remember the one I said earlier where it was like he, he uh, treated you poorly, but he's gonna, it's going to be even worse I don't know if you remember that, but there's different ways to interpret Isaiah 9. Uh, you can go back to last week if you want to see those. But I agree with him that it's a historical thing. I don't agree with, with what he thinks the historical thing is. I think it's, again, referencing Gideon. But nevertheless, uh, we're there. We're at the same place. We have a historical word from the prophet that isn't apparently a prophecy of the future, and yet the New Testament is coming along and saying this is fulfilled in Jesus or fulfilled in the time of Jesus. So I'm not going to repeat whether there can be such a thing as dual fulfillment, even though I can. Uh, I don't like that terminology. Um, we just sort of did, I guess, when I went through uh, Zephaniah. But there is such a thing as that. And we just need to answer the question, is there anything that would indicate in Isaiah 8 and 9 that that might be at play here as well? We don't really have to answer that. I don't want you to think, I trust the New Testament. And I'll figure out how it works. Not, I'm not going to stand in judgment of it. I don't mean to say that we have to do that. That's not how I approach the New Testament either. I didn't come to Christ because I checked every fact and decided I came to Christ because I was drawn and, and, and uh, believed. Uh, and now I'm trying to understand how all the facts work. Uh, but nevertheless, we all we need to do uh, is look and see, uh, Do is there any indication in this text itself that there might be more than meets the eye? Well, certainly the names of Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. I laugh, laughingly ended yesterday saying I'm starting to sweat as I get into some of these names and trying to explain how that can be Hezekiah. I mean, the names are, are fantastic. And uh, it, it, no more than Maher Shal Hashba is being called God with us, right? And again, there are people in the Old Testament whose names have the word God or Yahweh in them. It doesn't mean they're God or Yahweh. But this one, it's, he's piling on the names here. Right and and beyond that, listen. We didn't read verse seven last week, but there will be no end to the increase of his government or peace to establish it and uphold it from then on and forever. Right? I mean, it's it's sounding pretty uh, elevated, like Zephaniah was. Or we didn't go into this as much as I'd like to. We didn't have time. I, I, in the same way that Isaiah seven and eight is is structured as a chiasm, Isaiah at the end of 8 all the way through 11 is also structured as a chiasm. And that section in the beginning of Isaiah 9 is corresponds to Isaiah 11, the very beginning of Isaiah 11. If you read Isaiah 11, uh, th there's no question. Even Jews will say this is something that hasn't been fulfilled. This is future because no one has brought about this kind of peace. In fact, they'll argue against Jesus because he didn't bring this kind of peace when he first came. But it says a shoot will, what I will say in response is this comes right on the heels of the Assyrian in Isaiah chapter 10. Remember we read about Sennacherib and his pride and how God was going to destroy him. And then verse 11, chapter 1 of verse 11 starts with then a shoot will spring from Jesse. So the destruction of Sennacherib is going to result in or going to be followed by this shoot springing from the stem of Jesse. So I think it's again the same context, but listen to this and tell me that this doesn't have echoes of something greater to be fulfilled. The spirit of Yahweh will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength. Again, same words that are used in Isaiah 9, right? A great counselor, a mighty strength God. Spirit of knowledge and the fear of Yahweh. He'll delight in the fear of Yahweh. He won't make decisions by what his eyes see or his ears hear. He'll with righteousness judge the poor. He'll decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. 
He'll strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he'll slay the wicked. Righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the kid. Okay, we're beyond anything. I mean, I could probably make arguments for Hezekiah up to that point, but Hezekiah fails to, to fulfill these other things, the nursing child playing on the whole of the cobra. So there are indications, it feels like to me, in this text that more is going on than meets the eye. And the greatest of these, and the last one I'll share, is remember that I said last week that the Assyrian invasion was not just the context for Isaiah 8 through 9. In a real sense, it was the context for the entire book. Right? And remember Isaiah 36 to 39, that historical section that if you're reading through Isaiah, you're like, oh, that's so nice, a story. I can finally <laughs> understand what I'm reading, right? That section is the centerpiece of Isaiah, and it's about this event. And you'll recall, uh, go ahead and turn there. I'm not going to read four chapters. Um, but Isaiah 36, if you just scan through it with your eyes, just kind of look down. It's essentially the same thing you'd expect to read in 2 Kings 18 or in, or in Chronicles. Right? It's, it's a recounting of what happened. It's the Assyrian coming. It's the taunting of the people on the wall. It's Hezekiah trying to figure out what to do. That goes all the way into the beginning of chapter 37. Hezekiah goes, prays before the Lord in the temple. Isaiah gives a word. And then Assyria, 185,000 of its warriors, are destroyed. Right? That's Isaiah 36 and 37. Isaiah 38 says, in those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. And we've covered this. I know this is review for many of you, but maybe new for some of you. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. Well, what days? What days? Well, days before what we just talked about. Not after the, destru not after the destruction of the Syrian army. Before. In those days. Now it's going to tell the backstory. How do we know that? Because Hezekiah is about to die. Right? He gets us. He gets promised that he will be healed, and he gets a sign, just like Ahaz, that the sun's going to go back on the on the stairway. Verse eight, right? And and here's where uh, it's important. Verse six, and I'll deliver you in this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend the city. So it hasn't happened yet. It's a promise, and it's a sign. And Hezekiah, you know, has a, a poem of of thanks, as it were, uh, to the Lord. And then comes verse or chapter 39, where we see that Hezekiah, nevertheless, had entertained the guest from Babylon and had allowed him to see all his treasuries and basically, as it were, uh, consulted with them or come into league with Babylon. And so, in a real sense, he did no different than Ahaz, very similar to Ahaz. In fact, I want to read to you, this is Hezekiah, again, I don't mean to throw any shade on him. He was a fabulous king, an absolute, maybe the best. Again, um, there's, he's at least in the top three, I guess. Um, he is an amazing king. But listen to how Second Chronicles, which is, Second Chronicles is very positive. It, small amount of time on bad kings, a lot of time on good kings. But listen, it's very realistic. Listen to Second Chronicles 32 as it describes this event in Hezekiah's life. In those days, I'm reading in 24, uh, 2 Chronicles 32, verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill and prayed to Yahweh, and Yahweh spoke to him and gave him a sign, right? That's what we just said. But Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came on him and on Judah and on Jerusalem. However, Hezekiah humbled the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of Yahweh did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. So Hezekiah received a sign. He received a healing, just like Ahaz, minus the healing. I don't know that Ahaz was sick, but received a sign, received a healing, but his heart was proud, and he ended up consorting with the Babylonians instead of giving thanks and going, wow, if you're able to save my life and do that sign, I don't have to trust in anybody else. Hezekiah did the same as Ahaz. Listen to this. But he did humble himself. He did repent and ultimately pray before God for salvation and rely wholly on him. And God delivered them, but not before he had failed. Now, Hezekiah, this is where we jump back in, verse 27. Hezekiah had immense riches, all the good things we ought to say about Hezekiah. 
He had treasuries of silver, gold, valuable articles, storehouses for grain, wine, oil. He made cities. He acquired flocks. He stopped the upper outlets of the water, directed them to the west side of the city of David. We talked about that. He prospered in everything he did even in the matter of the envoys of the ruler of Babylon, rulers of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land, God left him alone only to test him, that he might know all that was in his heart. So why did Hezekiah not return thanks? Why did he express pride instead of thanks? Because he was left alone. Because God left him alone to see what would be in his heart. What was in his heart? The same thing that was in Ahaz's heart, the same thing that was in Sennacherib's heart. Pride, right? Apart from God, you know, being the spirit that guides him and leads him and produces the good things, Hezekiah failed like anyone else. As great as he was. It was only in that matter that God left him alone, and we see what happened. So why was Hezekiah one of the greatest kings ever? Because God was with him, right? Why did he fail like Ahaz? Because in that moment, God wasn't with him. Why? God has his own reasons. But regardless, what that means for Isaiah, and I think what it means for the book and the purpose of the book and the way the book's written, is that is shown in the first 39 chapters, especially as we get to that climax in the middle, that historical section. What an amazing deliverance. Oh, he actually did the same thing. Isaiah's. And then follows Isaiah 40 to 66, which is an amazing section that we have never studied before together. One day we will, Lord willing. But I'm going to just read you a couple of verses about a theme that continues to find its way throughout Isaiah 40 to 66 and see if you can catch it. It's in just about every chapter. I'll just read five of them. Isaiah 40, 9 to 11. Get yourself up on a high mountain, O Zion, bearer of good news. Lift up your voice mightily, O Jerusalem, bearer of good news. Lift it up and do not fear. Say to the cities of Judah, Here is your God. Behold, the Lord Yahweh will come with might, with his arm, ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. Like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. In his arms, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing ewes. Isaiah 41 27 to 29. Formerly I said to Zion, Behold, here they are, and to Jerusalem I will give a messenger of good news. But when I look, there's no one. There's no counselor among them who, if I ask, can give an answer. Behold, all of them are false. Their works are worthless. Their molten images are wind and emptiness. Isaiah 42, 13 to 16. Yahweh will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry. He will prevail against his enemies. I've kept silent for a long time. I've kept still and restrained myself. Now, like a woman in labor, I will groan. I will both gasp and pant. I will lay waste the mountains and hills and wither all their vegetation. I will make the rivers into coastlands and dry up their ponds. I will lead the blind by a way they don't know. And paths they do not know, I will guide them. I will make darkness into light before them and rugged places into plains. These are the things I will do, and I will not leave them undone. Isaiah 59, 15 to 17, just two more. Yes, truth is lacking, and he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now Yahweh saw, and it was displeasing in his sight that there was no justice. He saw there was no man, and was astonished there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought salvation to him, and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness like a breastplate, and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. And lastly, Isaiah 63 1 through 5, although we could have read a lot more than this, this hopefully will make my point. Who is this who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors from Basra? This one who is majestic in his apparel, marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who trods, treads in the winepress? I have trodden the wine trough alone. And from the peoples there was no man with me. I also trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. 
and their life blood is sprinkled on my garments, and I stained all my raiment. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption has come. And I looked, and there was no one to help. And I was astonished, and there was no one to uphold. So my own arm brought salvation to me, and my wrath upheld me. So you can see in all of that that Isaiah 40 to 66, while there are many other things that we could talk about, and hopefully we'll get to study this again in the future sometime, but very clearly God has said, even the greatest of my kings, of my intercessors, are, are all without what they need in order to bring about that final peace, that great everlasting righteousness. I'll do it myself. I'll do it. So we think about, wow, okay, so there's this prophecy of a king who's going to do all this, but God says he's going to do it himself. How does that reconcile? Well, we know, right? We know how that reconciles because God in Christ did come himself. And that is the third and final example, I think, clear example of our passage having tones or echoes of, hey, there may be more uh, here than meets the eye. Now we're done. I do want to discuss one more thing. Okay, and that is um, just a little bit more detail of why the New Testament authors would act this way. What is it? What's going on? So for, for two years now, we've said this section is maybe it's not even a prophecy at all. Or it's, if it is a prophecy, it's a prophecy about that historical situation. And yet, New Testament writers say this is fulfilled in Christ. And we've said for two years now that this is a concept, dual fulfillment if you want to call it, that exists in general. And there are indications in our text themselves that something maybe greater is going on. So it makes sense that New Testament writers would quote it. Last year we even talked about the nature of prophecy and how the nature of prophecy itself lends itself to this kind of thing. And again, you can go back and watch that if you would like. It's online. But in the time we have left, I just want to say a few more things of why would the New Testament authors do this? And what are the implications of them doing this? Like, we didn't even talk about this, but the, the worse example, I use worse in the, in the sense where if you read it, you don't understand what's going on. It looks really bad. But Matthew quotes Hosea 11, 1 in, in Matthew chapter 2 and says, Out of Egypt I called my son. And it's, I mean, it is not a prophecy in Hosea. It is about what God did in the Exodus and Matthew says Jesus fulfilled that. Why does Matthew say that? How did Matthew look at Isaiah 7.14 and say Jesus fulfills this when it was about a historical thing? How did Matthew look at Isaiah 9? Why did he? And determine that Jesus' move to Capernaum filled that. How did Peter and Paul look at Isaiah 8 and say that stumbling block wasn't those who were caught and ensnared by Assyria? Those were people who rejected Christ and tried to establish their own righteousness. How did the author of Hebrews look at Isaiah 8 and decide that that proved Jesus' willingness to call fellow believers his brothers? What what can we say about that? And I'm going to let Frank do the most of it because I think he's going to teach a hermeneutics class. But I want to say a couple things about it as I wrap up. First, while there are straightforward prophecies of Jesus as the Messiah in the Old Testament, there are. The earliest one you can think of, right, is Genesis 3. He's going to bruise your heel. He's going to bruise your head. That's not describing history. There wasn't much history done at that point. Uh, you know, That's describing a future event of the seed of the woman. Very clearly a straightforward prophecy of Jesus the Messiah. Those exist. Nevertheless, many, or maybe would it be accurate to say most, I don't know, of the beloved prophecies of Jesus are not prophecies at all, but are examples like ours where the apostles took historical text or older prophecies and said Jesus fulfilled what was written in that historical text. And I hope that does not diminish your view of Jesus or God's predictive ministry in pointing out his son Messiah. Right? That's a very common apologetic right, for Christianity. Look at all these prophecies of Christ. How could anyone else fulfill those? Right? Well, I hope that doesn't diminish that argument in your view, that those might not have even been prophecies. They were historical texts in many cases. They were not prophecies in the strict sense that we think of, like Genesis 3.15 and the, the, the striking uh, of, the, of the heel or, the, or the, uh, the seed of the woman coming. But I, don't, I hope that doesn't diminish your view. In fact, I think it actually enlarges the amount of content which relates to Jesus, right? It's not just the things that maybe previously we thought were prophecies, like Isaiah 7.14 or Isaiah 9.6. It's not just those that speak of Jesus. There's more, right? There's more. Jesus is seen 
in more places in the Old Testament. And I think this view actually makes sense of things like scriptures in the New Testament like these following. Listen to these couple of verses. Luke 24, 27. He's walking on the road to Emmaus, and he says, beginning with Moses, and with all that Luke, the author, says of Jesus, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. So he's explaining to them all through the scriptures the things concerning himself. Or I won't turn to this next one. You remember Acts 8, when uh, the Ethiopian eunuch is saying to, to Philip, who's... Who's he talking about? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about another, right? Or 1 Peter 1, 11, where it says the prophets you know, inspected their own writings to figure out what the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when it talked about Christ and his sufferings and the glory to follow. In my opinion, this understanding of the Old Testament and how, even though we haven't explained it yet, how the New Testament authors could look at that and say that's about Jesus, it, it's, it, it opens up the fact that more of the Old Testament is about Jesus, not less, right? However, this comes with a warning. Namely, the New Testament writers were inspired by God as they wrote what they wrote. Now, in my opinion, that doesn't mean that the only things in the New Testament they identify with Jesus are the only things that are identified with Jesus. I don't think they were thorough in that sense. They didn't write down every connection for us, right? So there are other aspects of the Old Testament that I think you could say Jesus fulfilled this, even if it wasn't a prophecy. But it's risky business for us, right? You can easily go astray in this and find connections that don't exist that lead to doctrines that are bad, right? And so you have to be really careful with it. And in fact, I've got ideas, but I don't find that I'll share them up here because I don't think it's a really good idea because I don't know if they're right. But the fact is, I think it expands. Jesus is what much of the Old Testament was pointing to, we just have to be careful. It's risky business. And the apostles never erred when they did that. They were inspired by God to call out these connections. We could err if we're not careful. But the main thing I did want to answer as we finish is what causes the apostles to do this. What We see that they do do it. We see that there's hints in the Old Testament text that there might be more than meets the eye. And we know that ultimately the Holy Spirit's guiding them and inspiring them to do it. But what's at play? What are they doing? How would we describe it? What's going on? The official answer is called typology. But I would like to briefly describe that, not with a lesson on typology. I'll leave that to Frank in the hermeneutics class. But with an analogy and with a New Testament verse, and then we'll be done. So first, the analogy. Turn to Hebrews 8. Turn to Hebrews 8, at the very beginning of Hebrews 8. He says, now the main point, which is really nice when an author does that, now the main point and what has been said is this, we have such a high priest who has, been, who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary and in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man. What's he comparing that to? Who? What's another tabernacle that maybe man pitched? The one from the Old Testament. Yeah, Moses and his comrades pitched a tabernacle. He's not talking about that tabernacle. He's talking about Christ being a minister in the sanctuary in the true tabernacle, which is in heaven, which the Lord pitched. Because every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, hence it is necessary that this also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest at all. Since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, he wasn't part of the tribe of Levi, so he wouldn't have on earth done that. Those Levites, and this is the key point, verse 5, serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern, that's the word type, tupas in Greek, According to the, it's like a mold, right? He was given a mold, a cookie cutter, to make the tabernacle. Make sure you do it exactly according to that, because that pattern matches, that type matches the heavenly tabernacle. He served, those Levites served, a copy and a shadow of things. You think about what a shadow is, right? right? A shadow is somebody standing and they're moving, and you can see 
or the sun going and being blocked, you can see that on the ground, right? And what the author of Hebrews is saying is those things were a shadow of something of greater reality. There was, they were a type of something that was a greater reality. There was a light that cast on the, the, the true thing, whatever it was, that when it blocked that light, it showed on the ground a shadow. And he's describing a lot of the Old Testament priestly service in that way. Now, the earthly tabernacle was, was amazing. It was built with skill. It had uh, fine fabrics and gold and was beautiful and well done. Um, but it was a poor and, though accurate, copy of something more great, something more significant. And again, that's why it was important. It was constructed just as constructed just as Moses was instructed. The glory of the heavenly tabernacle or holy place cast it as it were a shadow of itself, and that shadow was the tabernacle that existed in the Old Testament. I'll turn to Colossians. That's our analogy. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. Really close. This is the verse, and then we're going to be done. Two verse sixteen and seventeen. Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Things, all those things, are a mere shadow of what is to come. All those things, real things, important things, things that you could be cut off from Israel by not following. These were real things. Nevertheless, they were shadows. Food, drink, festivals, new moon, Sabbath days, they were shadows. What was the shadow cast by? What was the thing, the body, as it were, that caused the shadow to be cast? They were a mere shadow, verse 17, but the body, maybe your translation says substance, the body, the thing that cast the shadow, was Christ. So similarly to the heavenly tabernacle, the glory of Jesus himself cast it as it were a shadow, and that shadow was many things that happened in the Old Testament. Even though the Old Testament came first, and even though it's very real and very important, it is, in the end, to a large degree, what degree? I don't know. I'll probably get it wrong if I try to tell you to what degree. But to a large degree, and probably greater than we appreciate, it was a shadow, nevertheless, of things to come. It doesn't mean history can be discounted. It doesn't mean that any more than that first day of the Lord was so terrible and real. And nobody would be in the midst of that and go, well, this is just a shadow. You know, It was a real event, a real thing. It doesn't mean that the Assyrian conquest and Hezekiah or any of those things were not real, were not important, were not glorious even in, in showing God's might. But all of them still, as important as they were, are still shadows. Even the deliverance of Gideon, there are shadows of what Christ was to do. And that is what the authors of the New Testament are doing. That's what the authors of the Old Testament were doing. They were going... This is more. I said more than I see. On the ground is a shadow, but my words describe something full-fledged. I don't understand it. What's going on? I want to try to figure this out. And then the New Testament authors, under the inspiration of the Spirit, looked back and said, Oh my goodness. That Look at how the shadow matches with... Oh, and, and they described that. And they showed how, Matthew saying, I see how Jesus is the fulfillment of those things that were written down. They're not just playing fast and loose with the Old Testament. We don't need to discount the New Testament because of the way they interpret it. We don't need to say that's how we should read and understand everything. No, it's really important for us to understand what's happening, but also recognize there is something greater than even that. And our worship is of not Hezekiah. I don't think anybody's worried about that, but is of Christ. Now, that's a lot to consider. And I've done nothing more than introduce it here. Again, the hermeneutics class will be an opportunity for us to ask questions, go deeper, think about it. I don't know that any of us understand it fully, but at least we are on the same page, pointed in the same direction, and we can try to learn as we await Christ's return more and more.
But I do want, as we finish, man, I know I've said that. I do want to read Isaiah 9 one more time. We're going to close with this. And again, you know, see in it what we probably would have seen before, but hopefully we see with a little more understanding now. See in it what Christ, the language of Christ, even though this was written about Hezekiah, Isaiah thought. Picture yourself as Isaiah recognizing Hezekiah didn't fulfill this. What, it, what does this mean? And think ahead and us who have, are living 2,000 years after the birth of Christ know what it is that Isaiah's words meant. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. And the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you again for the story that you've written. We History becomes more important, not less, as we think about how it ultimately was pointing to something greater. And you become more glorious, not less, for having done all this. Uh, as we saw only the shadows for, for uh, until our eyes were opened, and we saw only the shadows, and then to see that those shadows were of something even greater, something even more glorious, and uh, that you allow us the privilege of of reading about that and knowing you and singing, having songs about it and uh, celebrations of, of what you've done. Thank you for all that, Lord. Thank you for uh, the way you delivered uh, in Hezekiah's time, for the goodness that you showed there in allowing his repentance after he humbled himself and trusted in you and for even being a God who... Uh, has one verse about that in seven or eight about his accomplishments and and even just to see your heart in uh, forgiving that sin and not uh, not dwelling on it or not even emphasizing it. Uh, but Father, greater than even all of that, and as much as we celebrate that, we celebrate what you did in Christ uh, becoming a, a man. I don't. How does that even work? Well, you you did it. You understood it. You understood how it would work. You planned it. You you accomplished it. And you united us with you, even though we were human and flesh and you were spirit and divine. You've united us with you. And please, God, keep us by faith. And thank you for, for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.